Hello, Berlin. Good morning, everyone. Real pleasure to be here and uh, really happy uh, to be here in this very important conversation with two female leaders of some of the most important European cities. And I think it was a bit of a call to action for me. So we are aware that we live in very, uh, you know, time where we need to think differently and to really act together. That's why we think that cities are going to be key to set up a green digital deal that starts really from the ground with citizens. My presentation will be actually based a lot on the work I was doing before being the president of the National Italian Innovation Fund. I was the chief technology and digital innovation officer of the city of Barcelona, working with UN Habitat to set a world um, program on democratic digital cities with digital rights. And I'm also advising President van der Leyen on the new European Bauhaus, which is a cultural movement for the Green Deal. So I will combine a little bit this experience in my presentation. Obviously today we, need, we live in this new non-normal. We have a series of shocks. Uh, we have this triad war pandemic and the series of crises. Uh, we had just now, and we are still in the middle of a public health crisis. We have an energy crisis. We have climate change, massive immigration, a war economy, and of course inflation going up. So we know this is a massive challenge for the planet, but this, in these difficult times where we have to rethink together how we are redesigning society and the economy. So I think we should take this moment as an opportunity to actually get our change and act change. When we're thinking, I mean, my presentation will focus a lot on democratic digitization and what's happening with technology and the power of technology and the need to redefine the relationship between people, government and technology. And if we look at the new supply shock we are living today, so a geopolitically induced energy price shock, of course, four times the price of energy, so this is putting families in a very difficult situation to pay their gas bills. I mean, the winter is coming, so this is uh, a massive priority now, but also extreme volatility in food, metal, commodity prices, and we see a massive change in the global technology supply chain. So we have seen disruption of chips, so chips are those um, you know, uh, components that we find in every industry today, semiconductors, very important, and also access to raw material. And maybe we're seeing also a decoupling between the US and China when it comes to the global technology space, and this is also due to a continued trade war. So Europe, actually, in this space, has a new task, which is, of course, Europe technological, economic, and geopolitical sovereignty more and more, but also, uh, I think, a continent that needs to be collaborating globally. But I think this situation is actually really something new that we have to tackle. And let's celebrate a little bit also what we've been doing during the pandemic. I think if we act together, and I think here I will advocate a little bit that cities can make the difference only if we act together. Yes, we do need nation states and we need a strong Europe in order to make the difference. And that's where cities have to take their power to actually from the ground up lead a pan-European stronger Europe. That's what I believe. And we've seen it when we did the EU for Health program, when we did a joint vaccine procurement, when we managed to transfer medical technology globally that actually was paid by taxpayers' money, investment in R&D from the states, but also today the joint energy policy that we need in order to transition, to make a green transition and to jointly you know, put a cap on the energy price at the moment. So if we look at this uh, global uh, action that Europe has been taking, important thing to say is the next generation EU, it was the first time maybe since 50 years that we didn't invest jointly all nation states in Europe around 3 trillion euros, I think that's pretty a lot, with the same direction, which is the two transition, ecological and green transition and the digital transition. Uh, you know, 40% of the EU next generation will go in the green transition and 20% in digital. I mean, this means we have an historic opportunity. I mean, any policymaker that's in the room 
or we do it now or we don't do it. Europe is investing 400 billion in digitalizing the economy and society, government, our society, or we do it right with European values and ethics and rights at now, or we are not gonna do it anymore, that's what I think. But during the pandemic, we also saw that, you know, we saw a fast digitization of essential services of society. Smart work, today it's becoming the norm, distant work, distant education, uh, digital healthcare, those are the essential services of societies. And these, those services are powered by digital technology and connectivity. So I think we should consider technologies and in particular connectivity as a human right. Because if we are not connected, we also can't really fully participate. But at the same time, we know that digitization poses new question of power. And it's not enough to just accelerate digitization, we also need to give it a direction. And this direction is more social and environmental sustainability. So how do we do that? How do we get to a fully democratic and green digitization? Well, that's why we're here with cities. We have to put people first. And I think it's absolutely critical that we redefine the smart city, not technology first, not top-down technology first, not putting big tech first, but putting people first. And how do we do that? We don't start from technology. That's not our problem. We don't start from the blockchain, the smart city, the 5G, data. No, we start from the real challenges that we need to tackle, which is reduce inequalities, affordable housing, healthcare, a sustainable mobility, the ecological transition and the creation of green public spaces. New public spaces, maybe like this one, that can become a, a new public space for knowledge creation or reduce carbon emission and fight climate change. Those are the challenges that we have to tackle. So we have to start from that, and then if we govern in a democratic way technology and data, they can help us to tackle those challenges. So please, let's move away from technological solutionism. Now that's a very important lesson learned. Many people tell you, oh, you have a problem, just create an app. No, I mean, we know that complex problems uh, need different type of complex solutions. So one of the projects, and it was mentioned by all mayors and by everybody before, where cities are really leading is this green transition. How do we get to zero carbon cities? How do we get to net zero, to a more circular economy? And we fight climate change. Yes, this is the fundamental challenge of humanity today. And this is a project that we've been working on in Barcelona, the Barcelona Superblocks. What it is, we recuperated 60% of public space because we uh, took away the traffic, the cars from the city center in 16 districts. And the space that was occupied by cars before, now is new green spaces, is new businesses for the local inhabitants, and is new forms of public spaces, yes. Even post-pandemic times, we will have to redefine public space and to go with green spaces and remove cars from the city center. I know this is a, a delicate topic, especially in Germany, but I think uh, many cities are experimenting these new sustainable mobility patterns where the actual space is for the citizens. And this tied together with the idea that Ursula von der Leyen two years ago, but it was actually signed today, yesterday, when she did the speech of the union, they signed also a communique for the new European Bauhaus. And the president said, in order to achieve the Green Deal, we can't do it top down from governments and just financial regulations and environmental targets top down. We need a cultural movement. We need to mobilize people from the ground and we need creatives, we need architects, we need planners, we need designers, we need artists working together with scientists and technologies. is this multidisciplinary approach that actually made the Bauhaus possible in a very, very problematic time of our European history. So what's the new European Bauhaus? We have to shape it together. And I think it's gonna be starting in cities, of course. That's where things happen on the ground. 
Another topic that we really discuss is the collective intelligence for democracy. How do we really engage citizen, large-scale citizen participation and devolving power back to the citizens? Just some numbers. In Barcelona, 400,000 citizens took part in shaping the government agenda. 60% of what became the action plan of the city came from citizens directly. When they tell you that digital democracy is about Facebook, Facebook democracy, don't believe in that. It's not about click here exactly, and it's not about giving your data to the big tech. It's about hybrid form of participation in the streets, in the neighborhood, and then online, owning your data in a transparent way, but being able to take decisions and being able to be part of the city of the future that we are creating. So digital democracy is going to be and hybrid form of democracy, participatory democracy, the real key, and that's the answer to right-wing populism. It's not less democracy, it's more democracy, and practice together with citizens. And also, proudly so, citizens are, uh, cities are coming together. This is the Cities Coalition for Digital Rights. Very proud to have initiated this project when I was a city of Barcelona with New York and Amsterdam. Now there are 100 cities working with the UN, with the UN Habitat, and you know, creating these ethical digital standards and putting our fundamental rights first. So when we do digital, it's not just about tools, it's about our citizenship in the digital age. And we need to not only own the data and be part of the conversation, but also reclaim democracy, digital literacy, equal access, I mean, the right to connectivity, accountability, transparency, you know, taking back our digital rights. And I think I'm not going to have much time, but I want to tell you, yes, we do have a problem with how the digital economy works today. Yes, we are moving into a data extractivism where only few big tech companies, some in Silicon Valley and some in China, are owning all the data that we produce, the wealth of the 21st century. Uh, Shoshana Zubos, my friend and professor at uh, Harvard Business School, calls it surveillance capitalism. Yes, the currency of the digital economy today is the manipulation and monetization of personal information and data. This doesn't go together with the GDPR. This is not information self-determination, as you call it rightly so in Germany. So we need to reclaim this right back. And we need to move away from a black box society where we can't see the algorithms, we don't, we don't know what goes in, we don't know what goes out, and also who is create, I mean, we create public value, and this value gets concentrated in the hands of very few companies. So we need to move in algorithmic and data-driven regulation of platforms. That's also where cities are doing a lot, in mobility, but also regulating the gig economy and transportation. And that's what we can do if we transform data into a data commons, into a public infrastructure that enable us, as a, as a global public good, to be leveraged, to use data in order to tackle the, the big challenges of our time, mobility, climate, housing, and so on. So this, we're gonna give back the data and the power to the citizens and have a governance framework, like maybe a data trust, where we, we reclaim data sovereignty, and we can put forward also decentralizing privacy enhancing data infrastructures, as we have done in the Decode project. So it's the citizen that is going to decide what data to keep private, what data we want to share, with whom, and on what terms. And that's going to be a new social contract, a new social pact, and we're going to create public value and use this data to transform our cities for the better. And we're doing an experiment in Hamburg, so I don't have time to talk about, but maybe we can join forces with Berlin in the future for data sharing for the public interest as a new paradigm. So I'm going to finish by saying, yes, cities, absolutely critical to make this change, but we need to do it together. And we need to show that the future of digital is not just the paradigm that we used to see. On one side, you know, the big tech, the Silicon Valley surveillance capitalism model that we see in, in, in the US, and on the other side, the big state, the digital authoritarianism that we see in China and Russia. I think we can do something else 
we can put forward, as we're doing in Europe, a new framework, I mean a new constitutional framework for the digital age, going beyond regulation, also create our technology capacity, our deep tech champions to compete in the future with infrastructures like Gaia-X and the real industrial strategy for Europe, but creating good jobs and rights and actually also gender equality and new rights for platform workers and for the environment in the digital age. And so we can go beyond the big tech and big state and advocate for a big democracy. A new humanism in the digital age, which I think it's a new social contract. Because digital sovereignty means that a society should be able to set the direction of technological progress and put technology and data at the service of people, human values, society, and the ecological transition. And that's how we're gonna build a green and digital deal from the ground up with citizens and cities. Thank you.